my first incident is um, when I was in Anvil Street and I had to go and knock up the neighbours and go run out of um, the door. And we had a back-to-back house and the living quarters were downstairs. So I had to go up the stairs, across the road, up another set of stairs to the neighbours and tell them to come and stop my dad from hitting my mum. That was the very first memory I have wow. of, uh, of being a kid. So I was born in, in this constituency, raised in this constituency, and now I serve it as the MP. Just down the road a few you know, less than two miles down the road from where I'm at right now. You and your mum then fled your dad. So that happened when I was six, so my mum was expecting her third child, my younger sister, and my dad eloped with a neighbour's daughter who was 16 at the time. And he went, eloped with her, and then all of a sudden, overnight, we were kicked out of a family home where we lived with my grandma um, because my dad had effectively taken somebody else's respect, another Asian family's Mm. respect, um, so we were put into the things were put into back, black bin liners and put in the back of a car. And my younger brother was a couple of years old then. I think he was three years old then. And um, yeah, we went to my other grandma's house. And then from there on, mum had my sister. And, and that's where life really took a, a really bad turn for, for my mum. In Victorian times and Edwardian times, you know, it was always even in Great Britain, if you like, the, the women were always blamed for the failures of men. Mm. And in this in this instance, this was, you know, this was more near, this is less than 40 years ago, when here was a woman whose husband had left her, eloped with a neighbour's daughter, but she she was chastised, she was marginalised, she was, she was her fault for not being able to keep her husband, if you like. Um, mm. So it was a horrible, horrible time, yeah. And- and and there you were in the back of the car with all of your belongings in in bin bags. I mean, do you remember what what was going through your mind at that point? I don't remember what was going through my mind apart from that it was really really chaotic. What I do know is that the black bin liners have become something that I use as a slide or a backdrop when I talk about my life because the black bin liners became something that I was I became accustomed to. So, well, a when I was six, we fled in black bin liners. Then when my mum went to prison. Uh, years later, and we lost our home, we were back in bin liners. Then we moved again in bin liners. We moved so many times when I was six, when my mum was getting her, you know, trying to get her life in order in bin liners. And the bin liners only stopped in my life as an adult, really. Mm. You know, so it was uh, the bin liners of a huge significance to me. It, it made me develop fear of any attachments to any property to any home mm. uh, for years and years and years so I'd you know attachment to you know the family home because I'd, I'd lost I'd, I'd been in it had had effectively had my possessions in a bin liner so many times and and the bin liner was really a sort of symbol of the sort of fragility and, and transience of, of your life oh yeah absolutely I mean from bin liners I mean I remember recently you know when I have my my own home now when we I, moved my children down to school them in London simply because I'm a single parent and moving down in in actually taking my belongings in a car Mm. was such an emotional uh, experience because it is like here I was in the comfort and the safety of a car with things packed in suitcases in a planned move Mm. a coordinated move and it was just such a different experience you know, it was just um, it, it it really really did throw up huge um, emotional. You know, it brought back a lot for me. Life absolutely that, transformed. Mm. Yeah, absolutely, completely. You you mentioned you just sort of dropped in there that your mum went to prison. I'm going to come back to that in a second. But you were then sent off to Pakistan, weren't you? And married off to your first cousin at, at fifteen. Yeah, married my first cousin. I went off when I was twelve, so I left school at twelve, went to Pakistan. Um, only was allowed to, was only allowed to come back, and it wasn't my mum who forced me into that. It was actually the rest of the family and the pressure, and and I didn't recognise it, Kathy. This is really important. I didn't recognise that I was forced into a marriage, that I was coerced into it through emotional blackmail until in my thirties, because to me it was just a done thing. You did that. You 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 know you you got pressure from the family and you did what they wanted you to do, mm. and that was the the done thing in my community at the time. And then in my thirties, I recognised. You know, whilst I, I experienced the violence, I experienced the abuse, you know, I experienced, you know, lots and lots of them. Um, and, and I still live with some of those long lasting injuries uh, from that domestic violence that I suffered at the hands of my first cousin. It was it it really did take me years to understand, apart from the physically violent rapes, that actually the whole marriage was in itself, um, you know, every, every time 
um, I was with him physically, it was rape because it was by definition, you know, it was a forced marriage. So none of it could have been consensual. Yeah. So that took me until my 40s to recognize, mm. um, you know, and to accept that. Uh, so it was, it, you know, I, I'm still coming to turn, I think, as, as I'm 46 now. And there's still things that I look back on and I think about and I think, OK, uh, what what how has that impacted me? How has that impacted my behavior, how I do and how I conduct myself, etc.? So you both kind of things you and some things I'll never try to open. You know, it's like a Pandora's box, isn't it? The memories aren't very good. So some you learn to compartmentalize into your head. It's like a filing cabinet and you put it away because you don't should you need to deal with this. Actually, I don't need to deal with this because it's not going to do anything for me because, it you know, I've, I've it's too difficult for me to to even open that filing cabinet. So there's yeah. some that I'll open. There's, there's some that I'll open and I forgot that I've, I've filed away because mm. It'll be something that happens, which will bring that memory back up and it might trigger something. And so you've so, talked yeah. about the long lasting physical and emotional scars of that relationship. Back in the UK, your mum, too, was enduring abuse in her relationship. And she then took matters into her own hands, didn't she, with, with really devastating consequences. Tell, her, tell us what happened. Oh, God, yes. Yeah. So when we when we moved, we moved so many times when my dad left. And we moved from one rented place to another. The, the one I remember the most is Derby Street, which was where the rat seemed as big as a cat at the time because I was only small. <laughs> um, we had an outside toilet. We were, I was scared of a dog. There was a dog at the uh, the back of the house. It was a back-to-back house called Sam. So going to the outside toilet after any time after night was really, really frightening. So mm. those are the kind of things you do remember. Yeah, of course. Um, and we moved. And then she met one of the neighbor's nephews who was you know, the knight in shining armour, bought a basket of fruit. Myself, my brother, we both had two TB. We were both in and out of hospital. We were very malnourished. And she, my mum wanted the security of a house. Like, you you know, back in the early days, the 80s, uh, the early 80s, it was all about owning your own home. So she sold all her wedding jewellery, went to a family, said, I want the security of a property over my children's head so they don't have to move again. And nobody would buy it for her because uh, she didn't qualify for a mortgage. So she, this guy said, well, I'll buy it for you and then you can pay the mortgage. And when your daughter turns 18, you can, you know, transfer it over. So my mum uh, agreed and bought this house. And the day he took her to the house, he raped her. And that started her cycle of abuse. It turned out to be a drug trafficker, turned out to be, you know, went to prison for dealing in drugs. He pimped her from prison for favours on the inside. The abuse that she took, she had so, so many times tried to kill herself and when she killed him eventually she was driven to she saw no way out she attempted in her own you know ways to try and get out of that situation she would have lost everything that she sacrificed everything for she was now you know the, the marginalized she was the, the the woman of this man who was married in the community you know she was she was everything but the respectable woman if you like by community standards and the definition of the concept of honor and dishonor she was a fallen dishonored woman so she she went she she got to the position where she felt she couldn't you know the only way out was to she was driven to kill him and she killed him i mean it she, she was wasn't the first attempt it was a third attempt but i think it was when she poisoned him and in between while she was poisoning him she also poisoned me and my sister so she was that distraught and mentally not there in the right frame of mind and it took us years to understand you know to accept that she and for her to say you know this is why I did it and this is what happened uh, she didn't talk about the abuse because of the concept of is it and shame and dishonor um she didn't tell anybody so it was when South or black sisters went to see her they they kind of saw straight away that women don't just kill Kathy nobody just killed mm. a man you know there must be something behind it you wouldn't risk losing your liberty and your free children for the purpose of just killing somebody unless there was something behind it. And it wasn't just because, you know, no house is worth losing your free children for. And that's all you've worked for all your life. Yeah. And then Southall Black Sisters, because they understood the cultural dynamics that they saw that, you know, there was a big story behind it. They could see it in her. And then it took them years of counselling and getting all the abuse and the, 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 the story of the abuse out. And then we had a big campaign in the 90s. And we eventually got her tariff reduced and she served 14 whole years in prison. I'm going to come back to the South Hall Black Sisters campaign because that was really sort of crucial in how you then ended up becoming an MP. Um, but just before we leave your childhood, you then, back from Pakistan, your mum in jail, you ended up bringing up your siblings at the age of 18, didn't you? Having left school at 12. 
childhood. I didn't have a childhood because, you know, I had it up until at the age of six, I became my mother's interpreter. I became her, you know, guide. I became her kind of, um, you know, that the, 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 to take her to the surgery and everything else, you know, little things that I became responsible for. So I had to grow up very early. And then at the age of 12, I was sent to Pakistan. Then when I came back at 15, I'd been married. Um, I went into a factory, started working, couldn't obviously work officially. Um, I remember my wage, first wage being nine pounds, packing uh, reject nappies on Thornton Road in a factory. And then from there went on to, you know, when I got a legitimate job, you know, washing the laundry for the NHS. And then I, I really got promoted to packing crisps at Seabrook's Crisps. And that was amazing at the time because it was so as soon as I was kind of like had a really, really good job. I had, you know, some, I had some ideas of going back to college and getting my GCSEs and and the things that I'd missed out. Here was my mum now locked up for murder. Mm. Um, and I had two kids. We'd lost the house, so we became homeless. We didn't have a home over our heads. We didn't have a roof. We didn't have, you know, I didn't know how to manage money because I used to give my wage straight to my mum at the end of the week on a Friday. I used to get a wage packet with all the, all my money in it. Um, where did you Where do you live when you were made homeless? I, well, when we went, to, I went into rented accommodation. Then, because I had my own domestic abuse with my own marriage, I left him, and I remember sleeping. There were nights that I spent in the car. There were nights that I spent in houses, which were people just full of drug drug uses. Um, you know, it did. It, it, I remember spending literally because I had nowhere to sleep. It, literally, it was a crack house where people were just there who was doing drugs. And although I didn't, I, I didn't do drugs and I didn't get involved in drugs simply because I knew that you know my my mum and my dad. My dad was a drug dealer. She got involved. You know, my my um, father was in prison for dealing drugs. So I had a hatred and innate hatred of drugs um, and alcohol. But um, I did, you know, I did spend nights in. I slept in the cars. You know, my um, friend, my brother's friend, he, him, and his girlfriend they had a little flat. They only had one bed, but they had a dog in it, and they had a a dog's mattress. I remember sleeping on the dog's mattress on Eid. And I remember that Eid was the first time that I really, t- you know, attempted suicide because oh. I didn't have my brother or my sister or anybody on that day with me. And I remember not wanting to wake up because it was, you know, so, so I had my own mental health issues to deal mm. with as a result of all of this. Of course, I did. It wasn't all, you know, resilient and strong. And there were times when I was completely, completely broken. Sure. And I genuinely didn't want to get back up. You're listening to The Ladder on Times Radio with Cathy Newman. Labour MP Naz Shah is telling me her extraordinary life story. Naz, it is extraordinary how you managed from that start in life to getting a job. You did go back to college, didn't you? How, just tell us how you then got on the first rung of the ladder, really, and started clawing your way back up. So I, I, I went back as a mature student. I got my GCSEs. Funnily enough, last night I was uh, looking for some filing, files and I found my certificate, which my certificate for mature students. Uh, I got a B in my English lit. <laughs> <laughs> I went back and I did uh, I did my uh, uh, certificate for mature students. I campaigned. The campaign taught me a hell of a lot. It taught me about inequality. I think that's where the polit- politician in me started, really, is the activism started where I campaigned for women and equality. So a woman could go to prison and get 20 years and a man could kill a woman who would be battering for years and years and get off with manslaughter just because she nagged him. That was the kind of inequality we used to see in the justice system. It was, and it was the campaign to free your mum with the South Black Sisters that really, that was what crystallised in your mind that actually you could become an MP too, right? Well, at that point, I was just lobbying. I was just lobbying the MPs. So so last night, Kath, when I was going through these uh, letters, I actually found a letter from Max Madden uh, from 1996, who was the MP in Bradford West. Mm-hmm. And I came across a letter from Marsha Singh, who was the MP before me, uh, before George Galloway. So I, I came across two letters from MPs addressed to my mum when she was in prison. And it was really, really fascinating thinking, wow, I'm sat here. I use the same letterhead now as as the MP for Bradford West. And this, uh, it, it, it really, really is amazing to be in that position, uh, to be lobbying MPs. And the first time I remember going to going to be, uh, see Jack Straw with Alice Mann and Marsha Singh and Anne Cryer. And Jack the Straw time, was then Home Secretary, right? Home Secretary, Gen- uh, yes, yes, he was a Home Secretary at the time. And I remember that the, the thing that left stayed with me was that the coffee that they served was absolutely horrible. <laughs> you know, it wasn't, <laughs> you know, and... and and since then, fast forward so many years, and I've been in when Theresa May was the Home Secretary and I had a meeting with her as an elected member of parliament. Wow. So I think my real, 
happened, the politician in me um, was when I'd kind of like got through past all of that. I had a really successful career. The NHS was amazing to me. I had a, you know, I became a residential social worker. I then went into the voluntary sector. Then I went um, into the NHS. That's where I was recognised as in terms of my leadership. And I was I had a lot of investment in my leadership development. And that's where I think the polished, you know, I'm, I'm still, you know, being, being uh, polished up in terms of mm. um what what made me the politician and then obviously George Galloway came and and I I voted for George Galloway because I thought he genuinely wanted to break the back of the brotherly political system which is clan politics of um, a patriarchal model of Pakistani politics imported from Pakistan into the community and which really really holds women back is not about the community and it's riddled with uh, patriarchal culture from men wanting the power for the sake of wanting power and becoming gatekeepers which really damages the community's progression and it's in pockets of my community so I I stood against that so I stood and, and I thought George Galloway really wanted to genuinely break that obviously I was very wrong so you stood against him here. And, yeah I stood against him in 2015 and it was a pretty nasty fight wasn't it oh god yeah he would he somebody posed as my dead father and went and got my uh, certificate for my marriage certificate, my Nikar Nama, and he pulled it out of the first hustin, saying, you weren't forced into marriage. Here you are. You were married at 16, not 15. Mm. And because your mother was there, it wasn't a forced marriage. Well, actually, in my cultural context, it was absolutely OK, normal to be married at 15, have a Nikar, an official Islamic marriage, and then have another one for the purpose of getting the visa and the legalities according to British law, because I'm a Pakistani by heritage. Mm. So it was quite perfectly normal. But for him to actually, and it was very damaging for the issue of forced marriage, because just because your parents are doesn't mean to say you're not having, you're not experiencing a forced marriage. Just because you're dressed as a bride doesn't mean to say it's a happy marriage. Mm. You know, there's lots of it. So it was real because we did years and years of work on the issue of forced marriage. And here was a man just trying to trash it away. And it was it was good to politics. It was horrendous. And I'm really pleased to say that, you know, in Bradford, he had a ten and a half thousand majority. I took that to eleven and a half thousand and got the seat back for Labour, and that was in 2015. So, and yeah. Life in Parliament, you mentioned you're still being polished up, as you put it. Um, it has been a <laughs> steep learning curve, hasn't it? I mean, you were suspended from Labour for an anti-Semitic uh, Facebook post. How yep. It was a pretty monumental mistake, wasn't it? I mean, did you ask yourself in the aftermath whether you were anti-Semitic? Oh, God, I had to. I had, I, I, it would be absolutely wrong of me not to. That night when I was, it was put to me in the morning and I, I received the email, you know, I had to really dig deep and say, hang on a minute, do I have, because anti-Semitism to me was a hatred of Jews. And I was like, no, I don't have that. The first, the first official engagement I did in Bradford was actually the synagogue. And I was really proud of that, which is why my synagogue came out and uh, Rudy, um, he came out and other people, the members of the synagogue came out saying, hang on a minute, she's not anti-Semitic. Mm. And I'd been to a cedar that week with Andrew Percy, you know, and we'd, we'd had a really, really good conversation. So he was like, well, I've, I've met her and she's certainly not, you know, I didn't have that. So I, I, I knew in my heart that that's not what I was and who I was. So what I'd done, I needed to understand it. And I was blessed enough to have the compassion from uh, the Jewish community who actually explained it all to me. And I understood it. So by, you know, at that point, I understood racism as in terms of uh, uh, colour, black, uh, all of that, you know, that issue of power. Um, all of that I got. So if you're talking about black racism, if you're talking about brown, if you're talking about inequalities of women, yes, I'd, I'd been and campaigned on that for years. But here I was, which is a, a racism, which is a different type of racism, which was, you know, which was really, really important to talk about, which I didn't understand, like I understand understood afterwards. So absolutely, it was absolutely the right thing to do for me to, you know, if I didn't, I, I wouldn't deserve to be the M an MP in any way, shape or form. Um, you've, you've been in the headlines again quite recently with the, a letter you coordinated to the Home Secretary accusing her of using her heritage to gaslight black and minority ethnic people and silence them over their experience of racism. I mean, she responded by saying that she had her own experience of racism and she has chosen to view the Black Lives Matter movement in a different way to you. Do you think there was something a little bit ugly about sort of appearing to gang up on her? Absolutely not, because I think it's a, I'm really saddened that 
uh, the Home Secretary actually chose that route instead of I actually asked the Home Secretary to reflect on her words. And that reflection came from a very sincere place because I'm politically black, but I'm Muslim and I'm a brown woman. I will not know how it feels to have the, sh the fear of my a three-year-old growing up in a in a place where there's inequalities as a black with a, a mother of a black child. I, I can't. And just because I've experienced racism, yes, we have shared experiences, Kathy, but that does not give us a monopoly. There isn't a hierarchy in racism. Mm. There isn't a, there isn't just because I've experienced racism that I totally get the policies right because you've you've got to understand the context of that conversation and, and it's really useful for people to actually visit Hansard and see what was actually said and what was said was here was a black woman who was saying as an MP I'm worried about my three-year-old son do you understand it and the policies are racist and the response was of course I understand it because I've experienced racism and I will not take lessons from you and it's really important for people to understand why that upset people so much. And it was absolutely right for the Home Secretary to reflect upon her words and, and look, because that is not about me dismissing her racism. Of course not. I, I, I really, really stand in solidarity with anybody who's experienced racism. I've experienced it. But that does not give you the right to dismiss somebody else's experience, which is what the Home Secretary did. Is let's look at the Conservatives' policy when it comes to when it comes to the Windrush. It just what's happened in the last few months. If we look at every recommendation from the Lamy review, and this government hasn't implemented them recommendations, so it's not serious about you know tackling inequalities like it should be. So if there's any lessons to be learned, there should be lessons learned that the Tory party, that this current government can take from Labour, uh, from Labour politicians. And it's right that they should listen to them. Boris Johnson has got his commission um, set up on inequality, but we're drifting from the subject here. Um, <laughs> you're listening to The Ladder on Times Radio with Cathy Newman. Labour MP Naz Shah has been telling me how she went from a forced marriage at 15 to sitting in the Houses of Parliament. It's, it's a, a total privilege hearing about your life story. It is such a story. Um, people listening who might be having a, a tough time, a tough start in life, what would be your biggest piece of advice to them? Don't take no for an answer. Mm. Write your own story. Write your own, own your own narrative. You know, if, if, if I'm, I'm here against the odds. And use use people who are who, who recognise and use that support mechanism because I came across some amazing individuals who helped me up that ladder. I didn't do it by myself. Uh, yes, it takes resilience. Yes, it takes personality. Yes, it takes it takes a, a you know a, a real real want to get to where you want to. But there are people. People are, are amazing. For for somebody who tells you you can't do it, there'll be ten who will encourage you to do it. And and people have issues every single day. They have their own battles. Everybody's fighting a battle. There's battles that I won't be capable of fighting. That others are. People have different strengths from different places. I just I just feel that we need to own it and believe in yourself because the world is for your taking. You are you are absolutely it's your God given right to live your full potential and what makes you you know the best that you can be. And you know we've had the the Black Lives Matter movement, which is is really transforming the way many people think about equality and inequality. Um, what advice would you give to your children and their generation about how to overcome structural racism and of, you know, sometimes a double whammy of sexism and racism? I think it's about becoming part of a solution and being solution focused. So there's one thing about highlighting the issues which are structural racism, which exist. And then there's also being focused, which is, OK, so how do we work through this? And that takes a lot. That takes a lot of compassion. And that takes you've got to get to people to be in a position where they're not just they're not. I'm not not racist. I'm anti-racist. That takes a lot of compassion to be able to give people the space to be able to dis discover and help people learn. So compassion is one thing but also be focused on solutions. Your mum was freed from jail after an intervention from the Home Secretary. I just wanted to end by asking you what she's made of your success. It's a kind of like a bittersweet thing, isn't it? She's, she's the woman who was on the front page of a local rag, being the fallen woman, being the murderer, you know, being, being that woman, to being the woman, you know, the mother of the only female Muslim MP, uh, first ever female to hold this position in Bradford West, the first ever Muslim woman in the whole of Yorkshire and Humber to be a member of parliament. Uh, 
So I think it gives her that kind of respect back. But and she's been some of the driving force behind my success is to not let my mum down after what she gave up for us. So I think it's I think she's very hollow as a woman, Kathy. She's very mm. you know, each one chapter of her life as a woman who was married to a man in England who got, you know, went through what she went through. Um I think it's I think yeah, I think it's difficult for her as much as it's brilliant for her and amazing for her. There is, you know, the journey there hasn't been an easy one for her. 